This is Duke University. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? <laughs> <laughs> Presently, I'm involved with, a, in a sense, a spectrum of things, but they all are aimed at one thing, and that is to explore the ocean and do everything possible to take care of it to take care of it as if our lives depend on it, because in fact they do, and to get people to understand why the ocean matters. And so uh, that includes, as explorer in residence at the National Geographic, having the, the uh, ability to participate in expeditions, put them together, and then execute them, through the, the, the nonprofit that I started called Mission Blue, mm -hmm. to similarly gather resources for expeditions and then get out there and and either uh, oversee them or participate personally as well as to communicate both through the National Geographic and through Mission Blue as widely as possible the nature of the ocean and why everybody should care I mean if you like to breathe you should care uh -huh. but not everybody <laughs> makes that connection I'm also uh, deeply involved with fostering new technologies I started a company in 1980 and other uh, 80, 81, 82, and again in 1992, three companies in all, to develop technologies for ocean exploration. Now, I'm not an engineer, uh -huh. but working with engineers to figure out how do you solve the problems of access to the sea, and even more importantly, how do you raise the resources necessary so that you can implement the the designs that are needed for robotic de devices to cruise around and take the human presence vicariously under the sea, to have autonomous and tethered vehicles. But I think there's got to always be a place for the human presence. So I love submarines, little submarines mostly. I love diving, but diving can only take me down, or anyone down, conveniently to about 50 meters with using compressed air. Beyond that, you can do exotic mixes of gases and get down to maybe 300 meters, sometimes a bit more for a few people. But to really have access, just as going to the skies above, a few people climb to mountaintops. Um, a few people can pilot airplanes, but for the public at large to understand what it's like to be high in the sky, we really do need to have harness the technologies that will enable really almost anyone who wants to go access to the sea. So th that's where I'm focusing some of my time and energy as well. You earned your master's at Duke in 1956 and your PhD, I mean, and your PhD from Duke in 1966. Doesn't mean I'm a slow learner. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know that there was family and dives and ten expeditions. Years, ten years and, and two kids. You know, <laughs> and things in there. What stands out in your mind about your time here? Well, of course, what I learned in the classes. I, I, I mean, as a student, maybe it isn't as obvious as it has come to be obvious to me that it's a privilege to be able to attend a class where you're given the distillation through the mind and the talents of an instructor who gives you an insight in a condensed way what you could find out on your own perhaps but you're you're provided with just a, a short cut to the, the most important knowledge of the time about that particular subject and your job is to soak it up well that that was a part of it but part of the, I think at least as important maybe even more important than the classwork was the time spent with those same instructors sort of out of class and students as well with friendships that have lasted right up through to the present time uh -huh. Do you have a favorite professor that you can remember? I mean oh, of course. I mean, there isn't one that I didn't really treasure mm -hmm. as, as a mentor in one way or the other. But Harold Hum, I really followed him from Florida State University to Duke. Uh, he really won my heart as, as a student. As someone who 
as a scientist, had the breadth and the depth combined and the willingness to take time with me and with other students um, just to make sure that we understood the joy of learning about science. It wasn't just facts and figures. Uh, and I already was completely uh, into the game. <laughs> and and he, he cared enough to help me figure out how I could come to Duke with some financial support. And for that 55, 56 year when I uh, earned hard-earned master's degree <laughs> of using some of the research that I've been doing in the 10 years that, not 10 years, but yeah, really 10 years, because I started before then, uh, e even as a kid, exploring the Gulf of Mexico. So some of the information that wound up in my master's pr project, plus a lot of information that was his that he allowed me to use in, a, in this first attempt to perform as a scientist with a publication and all that. And then another 10 years with a dissertation, again, with him as my major professor. Okay, okay, okay. When you started your career, there weren't a lot of women in science and particularly in your field. How much progress do you think women have made today? And what challenges do you think still remain? Well, again, thanks to Harold Hum, I was invited to participate in 1964 in the International Indian Ocean Expedition. Actually, I was the choice by default when a fellow graduate student, KMS Aziz, who's much better qualified than I was, he, s he speaks several languages, and, and he was a guy after all, and he <laughs> had much more experience than I had. I, was, uh, I did not yet have my PhD. And uh, he, uh, anyway, he couldn't go at the last minute, so I was a fill-in. I was a botanist, after all. They wanted a botanist to participate. Mm -hmm. It was only after the invitation had been extended and I accepted that they realized that I'd be the only woman with 70 men, seven zero, 70 men. And uh, there, there were some concerns, but everybody said, well, if you're okay with it, we're okay with it. And the headline in the Mombasa Daily Times when the scientific party was interviewed turned out to be nothing about the science. We poured our hearts out saying what we wanted to do. It was rather Sylvia sails away with 70 men, <laughs> but she expects no problems. And the only problems were the same problems that scientists still have exploring the ocean. You're up here on the surface for the most part trying to figure out what's a mile or two or three or four or five beneath the surface, and you're armed with pathetic tools for really trying to understand what goes on. We're still struggling to really fully grasp the nature of the ocean. So, but as far as being a, a woman scientist, what's wrong with being with 70 guys? I mean, <laughs> I've, asked, I've asked men, suppose you were invited to go on an expedition with 70 women, w w would that be okay? <laughs> Most of them kind of say, well, yeah. <laughs> but I have to say, there was a different attitude about women and it wasn't just here mm -hmm. at Duke. In fact, when I had applied for a, a position as a research uh, you know, student uh, instru in instructor to be uh, in, in th the botany department, I was told quite frankly that they really preferred giving those cherished positions to young men because I would just get married and have a family, mm. and the, the young men really needed to have that that uh, lift because they would be, you know, they'd make something of their education. <laughs> well, I hope that I've made something of mine too. I but, think you but have. <laughs> again, Harold Hum and others in the botany department took took uh, pity on me, I suppose, and found a, a way for me to continue to earn my keep by working in the botany department uh, in the herbarium. The pay was lower than as a you know, teaching assistant, but mm -hmm. satisfaction was great, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Learned a lot, too. I, I, I tell those who are in school at any level, if you can get close to those who are doing what you really want to do, and if you can get a job, so much the better, but volunteer if you have to. Maybe even if you don't have to, just do it. 
tag along and make a pest of yourself. Make yourself useful. In the process, you will learn things that you don't find out in class. You can't learn in class. And you'll, you'll find relationships, friendships that will continue well past the time you leave school. Do you run into many women oceanographers? Oh, divers? you know what? Today, it's really exciting. Uh, in many cases, half the classes in marine biology or even physical oceanography mm -hmm. are women. I mean, it's one of those fields that has managed to really attract um, young women. And I think it's fantastic. Uh, in 1970, I applied to be a part of a program that was during the era of astronauts, this was an invitation to become an aquanaut, to live underwater for two weeks in the U.S. Virgin Islands. But to qualify, you not only had to know how to dive, you also had to submit a research proposal, which I did with four other scientists. And it was only when not only I, but several other women around the country submitted projects that the administrators of the, pro of the project at the Smithsonian Institution and the Department of Interior realized they had not bothered to say women need not apply. They just, n they just never dreamed that women would. There were no women astronauts at that point in history. I mean, the first footprints on the moon were in that same year, 1969. Mm -hmm. and, and I was at Harvard at the time. And when I saw the notice on the bulletin board, I just <laughs> innocently said, that looks cool, I'm going to see if I could do this. And wrote out a proposal and teamed up with some guys who were working on fish. I was a seaweed person and it seemed logical to me and to them, but not to the people looking at the proposals. But the head of the program, James Miller, won the hearts of many of us when legend has it, maybe it really happened, that he said, well, half the fish are female, half the dolphins, half the whales. I guess we could put up with a few women. And <laughs> so we were invited, but they didn't want women and men living together underwater. I mean, again, today, astronauts, men and women together, high in the sky, he, of course, on airplanes or wherever, you know, it's become more normal for men and women to be side by side doing all sorts of strange and wonderful things in the military. Navy ships right. <laughs> and right. living underwater. Right. But at the time, we had a women's team, all women's team, that, that made headlines, not because we were scientists living underwater, but because there were girls living underwater. When, you know, the astronauts on the moon, women, aqua babes, they called us. Uh -huh. they, they, wouldn't, they called us not aquanauts, they called us aquanauties, oh. uh. <laughs> and all sorts of other things. But we didn't really care much what they called us, just so they let us go, and we did. Mm -hmm. But it's another example of the, the shift in thinking, and it, it's been a while, you know. It's a few years ago, <laughs> but it's not that long ago. It's happened in my lifetime. I've mm -hmm. been a witness to this time of change. Yeah, when you were in the forefront. It, it's still changing, of that change. and it needs to change a lot more. I think in the United States, we're far ahead of most countries, but here, um, I think I've witnessed it. Uh, it's true in science. It's true in the medical professions. It's certainly true in business, although more and more there are women serving on boards, women serving as CEOs, but it's the exception rather than the rule. Someday, perhaps that will change, but first, the idea that you know, it's the social, the cultural structure of things that makes it more difficult for women during those critical early years of getting an education and immediately following when families come into the picture. And women, logically, are moms. Uh, tomorrow's Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's a great awareness that you have to really establish priorities that, that, that work. And as a, a professional scientist, you know, some of the greatest stabs in my heart are, uh, relate to times when I missed out on some of the critical things that, that I really care about with my kids, even just time, mm -hmm. just quality time. Although they got to do some exceptional things, like 
diving with whales and swimming with dolphins and going on trips to strange and wonderful aquatic places. And they treasure those times, and so do I. There, there really isn't a substitute just for quality time, time, time. You know, to just to be there for things that matter to them. And uh, so I was fortunate in having parents who could stand in for me mm. when I had to be away or mm -hmm. chose to be away. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just they were um, left alone, but still, I feel the loss and hope that I have a second chance now with four grandsons oh. to help, uh -huh. you know, me at least. Do you take them on, on dives with you? I okay. have had the pleasure of taking my four grandsons and their respective moms and dads and my daughter, uh, younger daughter, who does not have children. We all went to the Galapagos Islands a few years ago. And whenever possible, I scoop one or more of them with me. And, you know, they're my best diving buddies. Now, did you teach them how to dive, or how did they? No, learn? well, sometimes it's better to get somebody other than mm -hmm. mom. To mm -hmm. or like, who's the best person to teach a kid how to drive a car? Not necessarily a parent, although right. my dad did teach me, but I think he almost had a heart attack in the process. <laughs> 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 You've done a lot of different things over your career, from coming. studying algae, <laughs> to developing submersibles, to working mm. with NOAA, mm. to writing for the National Geographic. Mm. Is there anything that you have done that you would have been, that would have been a surprise to you when you were in grad school? Something that you might look at and think, wow, I never thought my career would take me there. Well, I never thought I'd be a government official, mm -hmm. as I was with being the chief scientist of NOAA. I never imagined starting and running a company, al although it seemed the logical thing when it finally emerged as uh, one of the choices that came my way. I never thought that I would be doing as much as I have been over the years as, um, as a spokesperson for the ocean mm -hmm. and for science generally. I couldn't imagine doing what I did earlier this year in China on national television in China. Uh, <laughs> I had my Neil deGrasse Tyson moment on uh -huh. this huge stage with images flashing behind me just talking about the ocean and why it matters and, and what we need to do to take care of it and how China, I mean, when I was a kid, my mother said, you know, if you start digging in the yard and keep digging and digging and digging and digging, go right through the earth, you'll wind up in China. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that just struck me as a child as the most preposterous, awe-inspiring thing, that on the other side of the planet there was a country, and maybe someday, somehow, I would get to see the people who lived there. Uh -huh. I never dreamed that I'd be going there, and I did in 1973, as one of 12 women who were invited to go and meet our professional counterparts. And I met my professional seaweed counterpart, who was a hero of mine when I was here at Duke. I read his papers and, and uh, thought about maybe someday having a chance to meet this remarkable human being who was the first diver at Scripps Institution of Oceanography oh. in 1945. He went to the University of Michigan, got his PhD there, but then back to China, and then the whole cultural res revolution took place. And You know, you never know what's around the next corner in your life. Y things that, y y the best way to prepare for them is to get, just to expect the unexpected, mm -hmm. and not get so locked into thinking that your life has to be a certain way. In this country, at least, we have choices at this point in history. Some countries, right now, choices are really limited. And I think those who are coming along at this point in history, even in countries where there are narrower opportunities than in the United States, this is, <laughs> is the best time ever to be alive. 
because the capacity to understand the, the, the knowledge, the distribution of the knowledge, we are the beneficiaries of all preceding history. Some have access to that knowledge dis in a disproportionately favored way. And certainly here at Duke, mm -hmm. that would be the case. You have access and teachers who are really eager to stuff your brain with the greatest, latest and greatest insights into what's going on. But everywhere, knowledge that, that we know what stars are. Mm -hmm. I mean, kids even in the furthest reaches of the planet have the capacity to find that out. Dolphins are really smart and they look up at the sky and I'm sure that dolphins have wondered what those sparkly things are up there. <laughs> when they dive down into the ocean, they see sparkly things down there too. But clearly, they're not the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but humans can know these things. Elephants may know, wonder, what, are, what is all that up there? They, we know that Earth is round. What other creature on Earth can know that? Even humans did not know that not so long ago, or it isn't perfectly round, it's roundish. Uh -huh. Even that is the distillation of a lot of brain power over, over many centuries that now kids can just take it. I mean, I don't know how to make this uh, jacket. Uh, I'm wearing a ring, I, d I mean, with a great deal of effort and all the tools, I might be able to make something. But I, I, now we're the beneficiaries of language, of, of music, of numbers, and it, our job is simply to get up to speed on the tools and then take it to another level and then give it to the next generation. Never before have we had the capacity to know what we now know. And kids of today have access to more knowledge than even the smartest people who've ever lived in any time in the, in the past. But here's the, the other aspect of why this may be the most important time to be alive in all of history. That at the same time that we've been a part of this great era of learning, we've also been a part of the great era of loss in the natural systems that make our lives possible. And knowing that that's so, mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. A lot of people are really about to give up, and some have already given up, because they see carbon dioxide in the atmosphere reaching a point where all the alarm bells are going off because the consequences to a warming planet, to acidification of the ocean, to sea level rise, and the consequences to humans that we, unique among all creatures on Earth, have the capacity to, to pr predict based on evidence gathered over recent decades and going back over centuries, even millennia, of looking at change in past history and extrapolating looking to the, f to the future and realizing that the next 10 years are pivotal, maybe the most important in the next 10,000 years for making smart decisions that will influence everything that follows. We still have about half the coral reefs in good shape. Mm -hmm. About 10% of the big fish in the ocean are still there. Tunas, sharks, swordfish, cod, uh, even the little guys like herring and capelin and anchovies, greatly depressed over 50 years of large-scale extraction of wildlife from the sea and on the land. We have a choice right now, right now, early in the 20th century, will there or will there not be tigers and elephants mm -hmm. and leopards by the end of this century, or will there not? We have the choice. We have the power. If things keep going the way they're going, the answer is no. They're, they won't be here. Will there be coral reefs? No. They were, if you f just extrapolate how things have been going, will there be tuna? No, there won't, if you extrapolate the way things have been going. Or, lucky us we may be the most important people who've ever lived in the past or in the future because it's our choice. We can take actions while there's still time to influence everything that follows in a positive way, 
not just for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, for us, but actually, you know, for most of the people alive on the planet today, including the kids, we'll still be able to breathe, more than likely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, going to Beijing, he, breathing is a lot I more guess, difficult yes. than it is here in Durham, North Carolina. It, it's just a fact that locally, even over a fairly wide area, we can alter the atmosphere in ways that are clearly not in our best interest. Mm -hmm. But globally, we're altering the atmosphere in ways that are not in our best interest. We're altering the water. We're altering the very fabric of life that makes our lives possible. But the great, wonderful, extraordinary news is knowing that we've got problems and knowing we have solutions and knowing that people care. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can change our ways that are born of, of not knowing. But once you understand, you know, you, I, once you know something, you're stuck. You can't unknow what you know. <laughs> and that's why I, I can't eat fish anymore. I know what I know. And I, I was going to ask can't you do that. It. I just can't. I know too much. I know the value of fish alive. And I know that eating a wild fish is a choice. It's like eating a wild bird. Sure, they're out there. You can take them home for dinner. And most people don't. I mean, eagles and owls and <laughs> and those furry things on the land that used to, you know, sustain humankind. But most people don't think of eating wild animals as a necessity, mm -hmm. just a choice, a once in a while sort of thing. But some of the things that we're taking from the sea now are not just, you know, uh, readily available. We're, we're doing the equivalent of snow leopards, of, of <laughs> some of the the endangered animals, but we don't think of them as endangered. But when you get numbers down to 10%, 6%, 4%, 1%, which is where we are with some of the ocean creatures, ocean wildlife that you can still find on menus and in restaurants and in supermarkets, it's like, you know, we've got to do a better job of informing people about not only what's going on, what the consequences will be back to us and everything that follows. I was amazed when I read, it was, I'm not, I can't remember what piece it was of yours, but you talked about how, um, how much is, is of the fishing is lost in the bycatch? Yeah, sometimes 100 to 1. Right, and so they pull out, they kill more than they actually pull out? Sometimes 100 to 1. Look at the shrimping industry. Look at, go look at Forrest Gump, <laughs> the mm -hmm. film. And I mean, it's a great movie. That you see the shrimpers out there, and the trawl comes up, and it gets dumped on the deck, and here's this little bucket. They pick out the, the shrimp, and everything else gets pitched over the side. And the things that usually get counted are those of commercial value, like fish and crabs, but the things that have no value, but <laughs> they do in, in terms of the ecological value, in mm -hmm. terms of the life value. Seagrasses, sponges, starfish, they don't have a commercial value, but that's part of what gets scooped up and destroyed in the process of, of bulldozing the ocean floor with, it's like clear cutting the ocean to the equivalent of clear cutting a forest to shake out the songbirds. Right. You, you throw out virtually everything else just for a small amount of, of what you take home. And it isn't just the individual lives that are lost, it's the system, the ecosystem, really. It's just, you just destroy it. It's like, like destroying New York City because you want to take the pigeons. <laughs> mm -hmm. or, the, or maybe you, you have a particular passion for the taxi cabs <laughs> and you throw everything else away. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's, um, and it's that infrastructure that is lost with bottom trawling. It's the infrastructure, the, tos and the closely knit social interactions and uh, that make an ecosystem work when a when a long line some of these long lines with baited hooks every few feet with bait squid or mackerel or other less valuable fish deployed in the ocean tons of them i mean you probably feed a small country with a bait that is put on long lines alone but they may be stretched for 50 or 60 miles in the ocean sometimes only 10 miles, sometimes only one mile, or whatever it is, long 
lines. Some of them at the surface, some of them deployed midwater or near the bottom, but whatever they are, they don't just put a sign on the hooks that say, well, only swordfish need apply. Mm -hmm. So all you sharks, don't bite the hooks. Or, uh, you know, stay away, little fish. But, or, or dolphins or whales or birds. Or whatever it is, there's a huge bycatch associated with long lines. And in the process, again, these open sea, midwater structures, social structure, they're they're, they, you're just cutting big slices out of the, out of these systems, and it's happening so fast. It's happening in decades, not millennia. Right. What advice would you give today's graduate students? Well, first of all, be glad you're alive now. Well, first of all, be glad you're alive. I mean, life is a gift. Think of the alternative, of not being alive, uh -huh. not being here as a witness to the universe. That's what being a human being really, above all else, you can see and understand things like no other creature on earth. And I so admire and respect all forms of life for each for its own sake. <laughs> but humans are the most interesting of all, I think. And to be one is a gift. Don't waste your time, is what I would say. I mean, by that I mean appreciate the time you've got. Mm -hmm. I'm not at all opposed to just kicking back and looking at the stars or looking at a leaf or, or just listening to music. That's not wasting time. That's really enjoying your, the gift of life. But for those who say, I'm so bored, I don't know what to do. Oh, oh, I just want to oh, shake them and say, well, give me your time. I would love to have your time. For me personally or for anybody else out there who would just love to have the hours that you're, you consider yourself bored. bored. What's wrong with you? Just open your eyes, look around. Uh, you don't have to go far. I, I keep thinking of that little verse, and I, I don't have it exactly right, but Alfred Lord Tennyson, when he said, Oh, little flower in a wall, in the wall, if I could know you all in all, I would know what God and man is. Okay, so pick up a flower, or a feather, or a leaf, or a rock, or whatever it is, and just think about it. A grain of sand, I don't know, look at your own hand. Mm -hmm. How did you come to be, hand? And trace it back. You could just be endlessly entertained if you just use that brain matter of yours. And, and why waste it thinking that you're bored? <laughs> you spend a lot of time communicating to the public about science. What advice would you give to people who are students who are graduating tonight who might be considering a career of communicating to the public about science? Whether it's a career in science or communicating about science or just being science savvy. Um, some people are put off by the word science because of the image that it might conjure up. I asked <laughs> my grands one of my grandsons when he was about, I guess he's eight years old, he, what, what does a sci scientist look like? He didn't hesitate. He took his hair and went <laughs> like this, and he said he'd be wearing a white coat and had, you know, it just, it was kind of an Einstein-like image. Uh -huh. and, and of course, it was a guy. <laughs> well, the image of science should, should change into a science scientist is someone who asks questions. Who, what, why, where, how, when, whatever. Science, scientists, like, like a child. A child starts out as, a, as what you could call a budding scientist. Curious, asking questions, discovering answers, with a sense of wonder. Have you ever watched a two-year-old look at an earthworm? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, Ugh. it's, ah, what is this? Or a pill bug or anything. They're not afraid. They're just, there's just this 
wide-eyed sense of wonder. Where people lose that along the way, I don't know, scientists typically don't lose it, they keep it. And whether you turn out to be a musician or an accountant or a CEO or whatever it is, you should keep that, that joy of discovery as a big backbone of who you are. You know, science is nothing more or less than that. Someone who observes carefully, I would like to add with a sense of wonder, <laughs> mm -hmm. and who reports honestly what they see. And a, 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 the best of all scientists are those who not only <coughs> have the joy of discovery, but when they discover that something they thought they had discovered is not really true, but somebody else out here over to the side says, no, here's the reality. There's this joy of saying, wow, now I see even better than I thought. <coughs> so that you, you're willing to give up a notion that you've had because you thought you had the evidence, but then there's more evidence that gives you better insight, and so you're, you're empowered with, with new knowledge, and, and you just keep going like that. And even those who have published something that made you seem like you were the great discoverer, and then you find out you were wrong, instead of trying to defend your position to say, oh, wow, that's so exciting, and to embrace the new knowledge. That's, that's the really the heart of being a true scientist. Your, your goal is to learn the truth, to look at evidence, to communicate widely, and to the joy of, of, of discovery. So. My advice is, if you are a scientist, if, if, if science, professional, you know, hard rock, ivory tower style, academic, whatever it is, don't keep the excitement to yourself. Be, be willing to share the view. And if you want to be a science communicator, to do everything you can to learn about what s other scientists are discovering and to be a conduit Yes, go for it. And this is a time when science, when, <laughs> again, that word, it, it's become twisted and, and some are afraid of the word, either because it seems hard or because, you know, I don't know, there's, I, I embrace the concept of what, whatever science has come to mean for me. but. If we can just peel back the layers and get people to understand that it's really the joy of learning about the natural world and our place in it. And however you can express it, whether it's through writing, through music, through art, through research, just or, or some combination of these. It doesn't have to be limited to just one avenue or another. It's just the distillation of being a human being. <laughs>